Hello everyone, I'm Simon Schell. I'm the Chief Technical Officer at Scalvings Aircraft and uh, I'm here with our 007. Some words to Scalvings Aircraft. We are a German company with a production site in the Aviation Valley of Poland where you can find Sikorsky, uh, Lockheed Martin, Bret & Whitney and Scalvings. And we produce um, the aircraft, the SW-51 Mustang, fully made from carbon fiber materials which is unique because of the uh, surface details which we do in the uh, entire structure. And uh, yeah, uh, today I would like to show you all the features and um, um, things which we have developed with this aircraft. And um, yeah, let's have a look and I will show you around. Uh, right now I'm standing in front of our name 007 and uh, it's the 007 because it is serial number 7. Despite it is the third aircraft which we have built in ready to fly. It is serial number 7 because in the meantime we also have produced kits which is our second product line. So this aircraft is either available as a quick build kit which you can build in your own garage at, on your own or you join us in the factory in a so-called build assist program which we call build your legend and then we go with you through the entire building process in about two weeks so uh, we can streamline the production and then you get a ready to fly aircraft uh, where you just turn the key and have fun. Let's have a look uh, to the engine compartment where is also the core of the aircraft, the engine. And what we use is a Rotex 916 IS, which is a water-cooled, FADEC-controlled, turbocharged and fuel-injected engine. So um, it is uh, the, the ideal fit. We need water-cooled engines because the original Mustang also had a water-cooled engine. Uh, because with an air-cooled engine, we would have the issue that um, the original cowling shape would need to be changed to have the air the air inlets. So with the water-cooled engine, we can keep the original shape, which is great. I show you now some details. First of all, what you can see here, those exhaust pipes are just for show. They are not functional. Uh, but uh, we, uh, may, we uh, scaled them down true to scale um, as everything with the aircraft is 70%, so 30% smaller as the original. You can even see the welding seam of the exhaust pipes. Those ones are not made from metal, those are also carbon fiber, but to have that authentic look we even faked those. Uh, also all those little details as you can see them here are fake. They are just imitations in the outer surface. How we do that? Um, we have produced molds which have the counterheads of the rivets, of screws and many other details in the mold and during the um, outer or the fabrication uh, we, we apply the, let me, the, the, the fabric into the mold and during this um, uh, yeah, application of the, of the fabric we print in those surface details. The good thing is we can guarantee the quality. All aircrafts are the same. The rivet work, let's say, the fake rivet work, work is always the same. Also we have real screws which you can find here. Those are useful for maintenance purposes to remove the cowling to do daily maintenance checks. Uh, what you can do in terms of daily maintenance is uh, you can check the oil, the oil level. Therefore we have here a, a little door. You can open it with quick connectors. And now you can see a little bit of the engine uh, installation. This aircraft requires three coolers. We have a water cooler in the original position of the Mustang down there in this famous belly scoop. We have an oil cooler which is directly sitting here in the front. And we have an intercooler which we have located here on top of the engine which is this black element here. And here you can also see the air channel. So um, there is a NACA inlet on top of the cowling and the air goes through the channel and is cooling um, the, the, the air for the turbocharger. So that the aircraft has the full power, you, should, you need uh, cooled air. And this engine has full power up to 18,000 feet. The service ceiling is 23,000 feet. Full power you get up to 18,000 feet. I close it again. We have another inspection door, a little smaller one here. 
and that one we use to check the uh, brake fluid level here uh, in the in those uh, little um, uh, bottles and there you can check if you have a sufficient level of brake fluid also you can uh, check the battery if you need to charge the battery you can directly go to the poles here and charge it all right let's close it again a uh, few words also here to the painting you see here is is a black um, top coat we make it in dark colors here to avoid um, um, to be blinded by reflection from here as we use chromium color here in this area you can also see two different color schemes here the original had exactly in that area also a different material it was titanium uh, because of the hot exhaust gas to withstand the hot exhaust gas also to imitate um, this let's say different material we have adjusted the paint scheme so here you can see our so-called smoke titanium while here we have lighter uh, yeah, uh, polished aluminum which is a little bit weathered so it's a little bit aged uh, you can also do different paint schemes it's just our interpretation for the 007 which we have selected we also have other customized project where the customer uh, let us know exactly um, the color colors also the scheme with we can basically make anything which you like okay we've talked about the fake exhaust pipe let's talk about the real exhaust pipe the real exhaust pipe you can see here the engine the rotax 916 engine is a four stroke opposite um, cylinder boxer engine which requires just one exhaust pipe so this is that one here and uh, the, what is the most important thing with an engine installation at an aircraft? It is usually to get it well cooled. To cool down an engine is the most difficult part for us airframers. And um, to have sufficient cooling, we have um, yeah, made a, a various uh, measures. One thing is, on the one hand, you have to get air into the cowling, but you also need to get the air out of the cowling. Where you get the air in, you get it in here, directly to the uh, oil cooler. You also get the air in up there through this Naka inlet and further openings. And now how to get it out? You get it out by this uh, outlets here. So here the air gets out. And now you can see a little detail, which is this little wind deflector. This little, uh, little wind deflector is optional. It's not really needed, but um, we were in, in mid of July in Florida. And you can imagine mid of July in Florida, it's a little bit hot and also wet. And to be 100% uh, safe with the temperatures, because we flew uh, from Florida to Oshkosh to the EAA Air Venture, I wanted to be safe. And so I've installed this little wind deflector. And uh, yeah, it worked out pretty well. We All the temperatures were in, in perfect uh, condition. So that was no issue. So we kept it because it's a nice feature, but if it's, let's say, a normal uh, outer air temperature, you can also remove it. Also some words to our propeller. Now here you can see our uh, MT uh, four blade propeller. MT is a German uh, brand. Uh, they are also quite, yeah, quite established. It is a constant speed propeller, which is driven by the engine hydraulics. And uh, what, what MT does, they also have this uh, chrome nickel um, uh, leading edge protection, which is great to avoid um, yeah, uh, from stone uh, yeah, impacts, etc. So it's a very nice propeller. Uh, we are also um, now working on further propeller uh, options, but right now that, that is our standard propeller. You can also see a massive spinner here, which is scale wings made. Uh, also to have the true to scale approach and uh, maybe one more detail here is another opening another scoop and what you can see here is the waste gate for the turbocharger the waste gate for the turbocharger is needed as a pending on the uh, on the uh, altitude you either need to get more into the turbocharger or less and everything which is too much you get uh, out of this uh, let's say waste gate one more word to the cooling. Um, the P51 Mustang is quite iconic and quite unique because of one element and that is the belly scoop 
which you can find here down there at the fuselage. And this belly scoop in the original version had a water radiator installed and also we installed there our water radiator. As I said, the Rotax 916 engine is water cooled. Uh, the cylinder heads are basically water cooled. And so we kept the original position. And now um, you can also see another nice detail. It's a camera. In the belly scoop we have installed a little forward-looking taxi camera. Uh, as because this aircraft is a tail dragger, the nose uh, points a little bit up and to improve our visibility during taxiing, we have uh, installed this camera which gives you the, the full view to the front. And it is also showing you the landing gear. So we have a landing gear, uh, we have landing gear lights which indicate you the position. But as additional visual backup, we, you can use that camera and then you see if it's up or if it's down, which is a great plus. All right, let's have a further look. One more detail here also. Here the original Mustang had openings uh, which were used for additional cooling. Actually, it's a choice to do um, um, boreholes in here so we can also open them. We kept them closed because we don't need them for cooling, but it's a custom option. If you like to get them uh, uh, yeah, open, you, we can do or you can do it also on your own. Um, yeah. Let's have a look now to the next element, to the landing gear. The landing gear of the Mustang is one of the most complicated and also the, one of the most expensive parts in that aircraft. As you can see, uh, it, yeah, I think it, <laughs> it, it stands for quality if you see this landing gear. It's also a true to scale uh, down uh, as the rest. And what we use is an aluminum uh, aluminum uh, uh, cylinder here with a shock absorber installed here. So it's uh, a telescopic working landing gear which has a big advantage. If you do a hard landing and also a two-point landing instead of a three-point landing, you avoid, you avoid um, yeah, jumping away from the runway as the, the, the shock absorber is taking a lot of a lot of energy and that is smoothening the entire landing. Also one word to the landing speed. Um, you can extend the landing gear with 90 knots as well the flaps. So that is the landing gear operation speed. And you approach typically with about 70 knots. That is your approach speed. Your stall speed is about 50 knots. So we have 90 knots landing gear down, 70 knots approaching and 50 knots touchdown. Typically we touch down in a two-point landing, uh, which is great because um, we have also massive flaps installed which are uh, which means you can um, you don't need to have a high angle of attack as you need it with for example aerobatic aircrafts with which don't have uh, landing flaps and the advantage is you see the runway all the time so you don't lose the runway out of your sight and then you gently touch it down onto wheels with about 50 knots you keep the tail wheel um, usually up and then with about 35 knots you pull back the stick and and you sit down on the tail wheel. Uh, in terms of the brakes, uh, we are using Behringer brakes. Behringer is a, a brand from France. They are now well, well established. Many, many aircraft manufacturers are using them. For example, Zeros. And the great thing about the Behringer brakes is technology-wise, they are really good. We have made very, uh, really, really good experience with them. And another big advantage is they are well supplied and supported. So it doesn't matter where you are, you get that stuff. Uh, also, the tire is an aviation grade Michelin tire, which is also uh, very important as it's a wear and tear part. So you should have them available everywhere and you have them available kind of everywhere. Also a nice detail are those black anodized rims here. Usually they are red as the, the, uh, the brand color of Behringer is a kind of uh, reddish color. Uh, but we get them in a special black anodization which is a great fit to the rest of the aircraft design. And now I would like to um, talk about the most impressive part for me for the landing gear and that is our electrical drive unit. This, elect this landing gear is not driven by hydraulics. It is an electrical landing gear. And how we do that? If we have a look down here, 
we can see here a massive uh, block and this one is basically consisting of an electrical engine which is sitting here and that electrical engine is running a transmission gear which is sitting inside that casing. So the electrical engine is converting the forces into that gear and that one is driving a shaft and that shaft is operating the landing gear with a regular cycle time of about three seconds only. So it's a very quick moving one. Um, now what happens in case you have a, a failure of your electricity, if it doesn't work anymore for any reason? We have installed a mechanical backup. This mechanical backup you can see here. You can see here two metal spiral springs which are compressed. And because they are compressed they store a lot of energy. And um, here we have a Bowden cable and that Bowden cable is connected to a lever in the, in the cockpit. For each landing gear we have one uh, uh, drive unit and we have one lever with, with a Bowden cable which is um, where there is a pin and that pin is keeping those springs under compression. But if you release the handle you pull back the pin and then the energy of the springs is popping out the landing gear within about one second only and it is also locking the landing gear. So that is our emergency backup system. Which we by the way also flight tested already and it worked well. One more word here, you can see here our outer landing gear doors. So they are covering this area. In this aircraft still missing are the inner landing gear doors. Uh, we already have the landing gear door, we also have the main mechanism, also the electronical module to operate those landing gear doors in the original cycle. The only thing what we have to add is another locking mechanism here, as because it's such a big door it generates such a big drag with our 90 knot landing gear. Um, operating speed that we wanted to be double uh, or to assure that uh, let's say it's safe also with a little bit higher speeds as it may happen you know <laughs> time to time once we have finally designed that which will take uh, uh, yeah a little bit more time but probably within that year we can also offer those inner landing gear doors and they are also um, you can install them also afterwards so um, that is also fine Another few details as we are already down here. You can see here a pipe and that pipe is supplying the water radiator with the hold, uh, cold and hot water uh, which are going to the cylinder heads. You can also see our flight control rods, uh, elevator and aileron. As elevator and aileron are um, to, um, completely connected with, with push-pull rods with almost no slope which make them very agile, very, uh, very uh, yeah, well to use. And the rudder is connected with a cable. So just the rudder is cable connected, the rest is with push and pull rods. Maybe as we are already here, also another word, because we don't use the hydraulics but the electrical um, installation, you can almost see nothing here. It's almost empty. If we would have used hydraulics, you know, everywhere would be hydraulic lines, but we don't need them. And that was also one of the main reasons to go for this electrical solution. First of all, it's maintenance free. And second, it's a much easier installation also for you as home builder in your own garage. All right, uh, I think most of the details we have um, described here. Then let's have a further look to another nice feature, which are our taxi and landing lights in the machine gun pods. Basically, the original Mustang had its machine gun pod sitting here, but we don't have a machine gun, but we have something better. We have lights. So here and here in the outer machine gun pods, there are landing lights, which you can switch on by using a lever. And they have a flush mode, which, uh, yeah, which flush in the speed of a machine gun. So it's pretty cool. It's a really nice uh, detail. And the center light here is a taxi light. There is another um, lever or a knob. And then you also can use this taxi light. Uh, just as a little nice uh, detail. 
Yeah, the pitot tube you can find here. That is now our, that was our first installation in, in that way. So we made it a little bit longer than needed just to be 100% sure that it also works because we brought that aircraft for Oshkosh. That was the mission to, to have this aircraft available in Oshkosh. And it was available for Oshkosh. So we, we couldn't make a lot of flight testing before with our new pitot tube. Now we did some flight testing and now we already learned that we can also make it shorter. We, we kind of knew it already, but we wanted to be sure that everything is set. So we will cut it a little bit and now the pitot tube will be around here. Okay, another nice detail is this uh, fuel filler cap here, but that one is just fake, at least at the moment. Later on that one will become operational with an auxiliary fuel tank which will be here. Right now this entire fuel, uh, uh, wing here is dry. It is uh, our outer wing. Why an outer wing? Because we also have a center wing and the center wing and the outer wing are separate parts. So this outer wing can be slided, uh, uh, yeah, can be removed by sliding it here out. Oh. Just a little air display going on. And that just takes about 10 minutes. As uh, we have um, two um, shear force bolts, one is sitting here, one is sitting there. We have a little tool and then you can slide them back. Then it's mechanically already released. Then you can gently slide it a little bit out and you just need to remove one screw for the aileron. You need to remove one screw for an autopilot if the autopilot option is installed. And you have some electrical connectors which you can disconnect and then you can slide off. It's a 10 minute job. The real fuel tank is sitting here in the center wing. It is a carbon fiber uh, uh, hard uh, solid bladder tank and the real fuel, fuel filler cap which is also operational you can find here. The total uh, fuel capacity is 26 US gallons, so 13 gallons on each side. And um, the engine allow for dual fuel, so you can either take AF gas or you can also take the so-called MOGAS or SWIFT fuel, which uh, means it's, um, it, there's no lead inside. So either you take the 100 lead AF gas or the non-leaded fuel. Uh, depending on, on which fuel you have available. If we are right now here, another nice detail are those two... Also, eh? Auto fuel tanks Auto uh, fuel, MOGAS, yeah. No, no, I mean you, you spoke about 26 gallons, but we can double that. Yeah, yeah, L let, me, let okay. me come to that point in a, in a second. Uh, one more detail as we are here, here you can find little um, scoops, little um, air scoops and those collect air for an air ventilation which we can see later in the cockpit. Now uh, to the comment about the fuel, so 26 gallons is our fuel amount today. We are also working on auxiliary fuel tanks to double the fuel amount to 52. And that one, and now we come back to our fake uh, filler cap, which is already here, because this outer auxiliary fuel tank will be located here in the outer wing, and then we will replace this fake fuel filler cap with a real fuel filler cap. The idea of this auxiliary fuel tank is to be connected with the, with the center uh, wing tank and also uh, together with the ventilation. So this auxiliary is feeding the center wing tank and once that's empty, you use the fuel from the center wing. We have a, gra a natural gravity feed as this um, wing has a V-shape, so the fuel has a tendency to move inboard. All right, uh, the next detail is our uh, strobe and navigation light, which we have installed here. Uh, we have also colored here the wing tip. It can also be a different color. It can be the same color as the wing. It is just our interpretation for the 007, but there are numerous choices. Now we are at our first control surface, the aileron. The aileron is actually incredibly efficient. Why? Because we have made a 70% true to scale approach in terms of the size, but we have an eighth of the weight. So we are eight times lighter than the original Mustang. The original Mustang was about 11,000 pound. The gross weight of this aircraft is about 1,874 pound. So it's about an eight. But the control surface is just 30% smaller. The inertia moment of this aircraft is a total different one as original. 
and that makes this aircraft super agile, we see roll rates of about 300 degrees per second. It's almost like an extra 300, so super maneuverable. Uh, also because the aileron is controlled by push-pull rods, which you can see here. There's almost no slope. I can show you the slope. So now I'm full deflection and now you see I have a lot of force now. It's almost no slope. That makes them very, very efficient, which is also pretty good for the flutter speed. You know, the criteria for your VNE is mainly your flutter tendency. When this aircraft start to get, uh, yeah, to have an issue with flutter. Our VNE is now 216 knots, equivalent airspeed. Equivalent airspeed is in that um, speed range quite the same as true airspeed. It's just about the compression factor. But with 260 knots, it's still kind of the same. There is just a, a percentage or so. So we can talk about 260 knots true airspeed. And um, yeah, let's move to the secondary flight control system, our flaps. You can see how big they are, as in the original. This is also why we can uh, stall this aircraft in the, uh, let's say, dirty configuration VS0 with about 50, 51 knots only at gross weight. Also, the flaps need to be connected, so um, you can see also here is the split line, because here, as I said, is the center wing, here is the outer wing, so that um, the flaps, when you, the flaps are with the outer wing, and there are just two screws which you have to connect, then the flaps are connected. And those flaps are also operated by an electrical engine moving down the flaps, and to avoid asymmetric deflection, which is the most critical thing. It's not that critical if you can deflect them or not. Your takeoff or landing distance will be longer. You can still do. The important thing is that they, are, that they run in a symmetric uh, way and to do so we have a torsion rod in between both sides so that there can't be any asymmetry. All right, um, yeah, uh, where where uh, air comes in, also air has to come out. I told you about the water radiator, which is installed in the, in the belly scoop, and the air goes in from the front, and it goes out here, as in the original, just with one um, uh, change. In the original, that one was, um, um, you could move it up, up and down, so it was a kind of cowling flap. And the original Mustang needed that, because the original Mustang flew in incredible high altitudes and you know depending on the altitude you need a certain setup with your cowling flap this aircraft can cruise up to 23,000 feet as the service ceiling of the Rotex is 23,000 feet but you typically cruise probably between 8 and 10,000 feet maybe here and there 12,000 feet so in that altitude range that one can be fixed and it's still super uh, well working yeah, uh, here is our COM antenna that you have radio. Uh, it's really working well. We have made range tests and we are competing with also other aircraft, so that is well working. You can find here our static port. So here we have static, as said, uh, we have the pitot tube below the wing, but here we get our statics from both sides. Uh, yeah, and now we are here at the tail landing gear. Also, the tail landing gear is retractable. It is castor free, uh, rotatable, but also you can lock it. And when it is locked, you can still steer it with about eight degrees to each side. So you can do um, corrections on your runway without yeah, uh, having um, yeah, a shimmy on the wheel, which is great because it reduced the, or it, it in, increased the, the lifetime of the wheel. And it's also, let's say, yeah, nice for the structure. Also to have uh, an inspection for the landing gear without getting all the way down there, we have here a little door which you can open. And here you can check um, the landing gear, your shock absorber, which is uh, a rubber. And that, uh, that means you can also check the tension of the cables and everything because the rudder cables are connected to the tail landing gear and um, they pass the tail landing gear and then they go to the rudder. All right, I close it again. Another nice uh, detail which we have also copied from the original are the, um, the fairings here, the, uh, from the horizontal stabilizer to the vertical stabilizer. And also, um, I, I forgot that maybe to mention here, we have the same, so those are fairings which cover 
the fuselage and the wing to make it aerodynamically more efficient and of course it's also the optical impression you get uh, yeah, which improves the entire thing. All right, let's have a um, talk about the empennage and our next control surface, the elevator, which you can find here. And what we see here is also our horn. This elevator, um, also for um, to prevent from flutter, need to be balanced. And how to balance a control surface? Um, there are several um, ways to do. The original Mustang had a, had a horn, so we also using a horn. So here is uh, weight counterweight. To, um, to compensate the weight of everything behind the hinge line. Here you can see the hinge line. And so to neutralize um, um, the weight behind the hinge line, we compensate it with counterweight here. It's also operated with push-pull rods. Super stiff, you see almost zero slope. Now we are here at our 007. <laughs> Uh, as said, 007 because it's serial number 7 and it's also the first aircraft which we have registered here in the USA. So we went through the entire FAA, FISTO and DAR process to um, get the, um, uh, the Airworthiness certificate and we were lucky because we got November 51 007. How better the registration can be for that airplane and uh, yeah. All right, uh, let's have a talk about the rudder. Why I'm quite proud about the rudder, because here's another phenomenal detail. The original rudder of the Mustang was made from fabric. Why? Uh, fabric is quite stiff. It's actually more stiff than aluminum. And um, a fabric requires this certain stitching. And you can see here, we even, we even imitate the fabric stitching. This is no fabric, it is carbon fiber. In the original was fabric, so we have imitated that original look. We also have a tail light, a white tail light here. Uh, here, as I said, you can see the rudder cable. The rudder is the only one which is connected with cables. This is also, by the way, the 216 knots uh, limitation we currently have because of the rudder. Uh, in terms of flutter speed, it's always the loose, the loose control surface. So it's not like you stand in the rudder, you you keep it uh, fixed. No, you have to assume a loose rudder because maybe you now make uh, uh, breakfast or so, and then you get hit by a severe gust, and then it starts shaking. Uh, to prevent from flutter, we have also undertaken the aircraft with many measures. Also here you can find a rudder horn where we have counter uh, balance or counter mass installed. And also the rudder pedals, where the rudder cables are connected ultimately, have um, down springs, pushing them a little bit. Original Mustangs, yeah, <laughs> spam can and we really. Um, so to even if you are not in the rudder, you are a little bit in the rudder because there are springs which, let's say, keep a certain force in there. The rudder can be trimmed. Here is an electrical driven trim tub. So there is a trim and a trim electrical trim engine sitting here in the stabilizer. And uh, here we have a, a rod on that side. And that is operating this electrical trim. You get the indication in typically in your Garmin display. There you can see the position. You also feel it. And typically we have a little bit left deflection because that one is moving the rudder a little. Wow. Uh, because you need a little bit right rudder, uh, right rudder for takeoff. Also, the elevator has an electrical trim. Here is the trim tub, so that one you can also uh, use for trim. And we have in this aircraft installed a two-axis autopilot. The autopilot is not running the trim tub. We have put the uh, trim, uh, the autopilot service directly on the on the push-pull rods of the um, elevator and the aileron. The rudder is not connected to the autopilot. It's simply not needed. The two axes are more than fine. Okay, um, then I think we have, ah yeah, maybe one more detail for the aileron. The aileron um, has no uh, trim, uh, no electrical trim, but it, you can adjust it on the ground. Here uh, we have a rod and uh, with that screw you can just uh, turn it a little bit and adjust it. Yeah. Okay, I think we have talked about the outside. Now let's move to the inside. Before we move into the inside, uh, to the interior, one more word to the canopy. 
the canopy is slightly modified. We modified it in a way that we stretched it a little bit to the aft because this one is a real double seater in a tandem configuration. And uh, that both pilots have the ideal view, we've made it a little bit longer. That means you can go up a little bit higher, which is improving your visibility. Uh, the canopy can be locked. Uh, the canopy is sliding and turning. I show you now how it turns. This is now kind of open, so now we can turn it. In that position, you have perfect access to both seats. So we typically step up here. You can use the front wheel as step. So you can either come from the front or also from the from the back, depending on, yeah, on maybe your size and how you like to do it. And uh, the entire canopy mechanism is um, very massive. It's well made, we've tested it. And it's also equipped with a emergency release function. In an emergency and where you think you better um, get rid of the canopy, you can pull the red uh, lever to the back, also the black one. And then here is a pin which is going up and then you can slide off this uh, slider from that rail. And then the canopy uh, get air and flies away. This aircraft, as I said, is a double seater and you have full control on both seats. That is meaning you can fly the aircraft also from the back. The, the actual the pilot sitting in the front. So when you fly by your own, just a single pilot in the front, your passenger or co-pilot sits here in the back and you can, uh, you have ele elevator and aileron. You have also rudder pedals there, which can be even adjusted. And we have power and propeller lever. That is all you need to have an, a nice flight experience. You can also see your, the primary flight uh, information, moving map and stuff like that. This aircraft is equipped with a ballistic rescue system, as you know it maybe from Cirrus. And what does it mean? In front of the windscreen we have uh, a panel where uh, is a parachute underneath the cowling and there's a rocket and if you now pull that handle, you release the rocket. There's, the rocket shoots out that way and is moving up a parachute. Then following happens, here underneath that skin there are belts on both sides. A belt and this belt is popping out of the structure as here is a single connection point and in the front we have two points and then the entire aircraft is hanging on a big parachute which you may, yeah, it's, it's really just for emergency, but imagine you have a mid-air collision or something like this. Maybe you are losing your wing or your elevator, which is a severe issue. Um, you have a backup, you have a, a, a parachute. Yeah, uh, maybe another word um, to, the, to the cockpit. Before you get flying or you take off, uh, probably you need to put some luggage into your aircraft. And uh, yeah, where you can put some luggage into the airplane, it's actually here. How to put luggage in there? You put the shoulder straps beside and now you can turn the seat to the front. You can also see nice elements like here, document pouch. So here you can put in the, the AFM, the flight book and whatever. Also here another document pouches. And now you can see our uh, baggage compartment, which is actually quite big. Uh, the capacity weight-wise is approximately 40 pounds, but you have to assure the entire weight and balance range, of course. Uh, you can also see here lugs. So with those lugs, um, you can um, yeah, you can take straps to um, secure your luggage. And uh, also a nice detail, here are the rudder cables. And that the rudder cable is not blocked by loose baggage if you don't secure it. We have here those covers, so if baggage bumps to the side, it cannot block the rudder cables. Um, the baggage wall, uh, the baggage compartment is um, limited by a wall, which is here. That wall you can also remove and the entire hull here is um, is empty. So for example if you want to go skiing and you have skiers uh, you can put them in a bag, you can remove the wall and then you can also slide them in here the, the, the fuselage. Weight and balance have to be assured of course but other than that that can be done. Now you can also see our uh, upholstery, our seat. Um, the seat. The seat is crash tested. It comes here with also a nice headrest. Um, that was now our idea. You can also do other upholsteries. Oh, there's a knife, <laughs> a, 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 a belt cutter. <laughs> Let's put it in here in the baggage compartment. 
Uh, here now we have made diamond stitching. You can also do other stuff. You can also combine leather with fabric. Uh, here also another stitching for the 007. Another nice feature is this air ventilation here. As we said outside there are the scoops and they provide you with fresh air. Uh, it's a very nice thing, especially when it's hot. All right, uh, that's about that. Uh, yeah, if you want to connect your headset, you can find the panel here. So the rear passenger or Kupalik can put the headset here. And we also have the power output. So if you have a, um, a noise cancellation headset and you don't want to have the issue that exactly then when you want to fly, your batteries are empty, you can use the, the power outlet and you get a power supply all the time. Okay, uh, then let me jump into the cockpit and I'll show you the uh, pilot seat. By the way, I now show you how to get into the aircraft from the rear. I just grab here and I go up and now I step here on the seat. Now the nice thing is I can sit down here and then I can swing in my left leg and just slide into the cockpit. Now I wear the airplane, which is great because that is giving me the fighter feeling. What we have in the cockpit? First of all, we have here a glare shield. That glare shield is now the maximum uh, length. We can also make it shorter. It's a little bit the, uh, yeah, your own choice. Also very important here, we have steel uh, reinforcements. They are important because this frame here is working as roll roll bar roll over bar something yeah so so if you flip over this um, element is yeah keeping you alive that you can still get out of the airplane and yeah let's have a talk about the instrument panel now we have numerous elements here uh, let's start with the landing gear uh, panel or um, um, yeah, the control unit it's actually well fitting into our instrument panel shape and you get the full led indication green when you are um, when it's down and locked and then you have transition lights red lights during the um, retraction and once it's retracted you don't get a light anymore uh, we also have a test button for the light so when i push here all my lights um, um, if everything is working well you see all the lights we also have a check gear position light so in case you run the flaps but you didn't extend the landing gear you get here a kind reminder that you should uh, extend your landing gear now what we have here is our so-called gold package gold package is meaning that we have a 10 inch 3x touch uh, Garmin monitor here with a G5 backup and the 7 inch 3x touch in the back. We also have a silver package then we don't use a 10 inch 3x touch but a 7 inch 3x touch in addition to um, analog gauges which are here it's a little bit more yeah maybe more uh, authentic with those uh, round gauges. The nice thing is with Garmin you can also get round gauge indication in your glass which I personally prefer and uh, in the silver package you don't have the G5 then anymore because your backup are those round gauges here. Uh, the transponder and radio I kept separated because I wanted to have the redundancy. In case you have a loss of your Garmin you can still set the emergency frequency with your transponder, you can still adjust the frequency to the tower where you may want to land so um, you would lose it or the, the frequency would be that one um, which is in here when you have a loss of the system here you can still uh, yeah, you have a double system you can also run the frequencies you can change them by using the Garmin or you, you, you uh, do it here all right let's go from the left to the right here is our ELT panel so this aircraft is equipped with an emergency locator transmitter as you which is typically installed in every aircraft so that one we can find here as a transponder radio Garmin G5 for primary flight display with a backup battery which is useful for about 45 minutes which should bring you safely to your next alternate landing panel we talked about Garmin 3x touch 10 inch here is our own made flap selector um, so a flap switch with three um, stages then here is our essential um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, switch panel 
uh, for the lights and also the FS1, FS2, this is FS1, FS2 is in the back. Now our compass with its deviation chart, I know it's mandatory so it's in there. <laughs> uh, here we have a USB port which is useful to charge um, your smartphone or iPad or whatever you have. And here is our engine control panel. That is also scale wings made and uh, you have all your essentials which are needed to run uh, the engine and also your master. So um, um, you turn the key and then you get the battery connected. Very nice detail you can see here our fighter style two row circle breaker panel with all the essentials and the non-essentials down there. All right, uh, some words uh, to um, the power quadrant. You can find here the power quadrant with the power lever, propeller lever, a friction lever, and the tail lock mechanism. I lock it now. Locked. Unlocked. Uh, the arrangement is made in a way that you can't miss it. Uh, all right. Our stick with uh, plenty of buttons, uh, taxi light, autopilot disengage in case uh, there is an autopilot installed. Here we have elevator uh, and rudder trim. This is our landing light mode. The landing light can flash in a machine gun frequency that you can operate here as in the past. And here is the COM. You can also put another uh, function here if you like. At the moment uh, we don't have functionality here. Now to the landing gear. Here you can find the emergency release handles. Left landing gear, tail landing gear, right landing gear. Uh, also circle breakers. Before you do that you pull the circle breaker and then you would pull the uh, handles in emergency. Another air vents to give you fresh air. This aircraft is also can be equipped with a, a cockpit heating system. And this cockpit heating system is great because it does not use the hot air from the Marflow exhaust pipe. Uh, it is using the hot water. There is no risk to get a carbon monoxide uh, uh, poison, which is great because there were many accidents already and it's something maybe a lesson learned, not using exhaust gas, using water. If you have a water-cooled engine, you can do that. So here now you get cold air. You can see this with this blue ring. Down there is another lever with a red ring and that one is now turning on the cockpit heater. You can also mix the air and adjust it like you're in, in the shower or so. Quite similar. Now it's hot. Let's use the cold air. Here we have a park brake. Now it's activated and a fuel selector. This aircraft is just equipped with on-off. Um, it is working but we will now check, go back to left, right, on-off. It's a low-wing airplane and naturally that is the better thing. The emergency release for the parachute for the pilot, now it's secured with a cotter pin. Before you go flying you release it, otherwise you couldn't pull it. You need a certain force so you cannot just do it unintentionally. Ideally you take both hands and pull it, uh, but when it's on the ground we secure it. Also you can find document pouches for your personal stuff. And yeah, rudder pedals, those can be adjusted as well. The real rudder pedals can be adjusted. Here I have a pin which I pull down and then I can move it and, and they can be adjusted. Uh, oh, now it's back. It's spring-loaded so it pops up. The uh, rudder pedal in the front, uh, it's a little bit dark now, maybe you can see it a little bit. Here you, can, you, here you have a black lever and here is another black lever. If you pull that one, it comes to your, fr um, it, it goes forward or to, to, to your end and if you pull it and you push in the rudder you can slide it back and this is how we can uh, adjust the cockpit to fit people up to 6.9 feet 6.9 so very huge people can fit that airplane uh, you can also see our slim uh, harness installation not that many stuff is needed and another air vent here and your headset panel is here all right uh, that's the cockpit. I hope you liked it. If you have any further questions, ask this dude to ask me and then I will provide you with further infos. Thank you and have a good time. Cheers. That was a great outro. <laughs>